God, uh, the Bible, but I came across a really interesting story that, that gives a nice parallel to the Christian experience. Um, and I think it serves as a really good parable. And so uh, I think it's very relevant to us. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer, uh, and then we'll carry on. Heavenly Father, I just pray for uh, the anointing of this time now. Lord, as we, uh, we study through your word, I just pray that you would uh, speak through me, and Lord, uh, speak through the people here as well. Lord, and close us in uh, with your angels. Lord, with uh, the Holy Spirit, that he might speak to each one of us today. Uh, Lord, uh, direct my thoughts, and uh, if I've added things that I shouldn't, uh, please cut them out, and uh, vice versa, please, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this story is from Greek mythology. Don't bother coming to me afterwards wanting to talk about Greek mythology because this story is the, the sum of my knowledge on the topic. <laughs> if it's a story that I came across, I know nothing other than that. Um, so in Greek mythology, there was a dangerous island that sailors encountered. On this island lived three sirens. Um, these mythical creatures sang songs that sailors could not resist. I'm sure you've heard of, heard of this. Uh, on hearing the captivating singing, sailors would drive their boats onto the rocky shore and drown. They simply could not resist the gravitational maladies. The sirens, like sin, lured passing ships to their death and destruction with hypnotic songs. This is how you pronounce it, isn't it? Sirens? Yeah, I always thought, I wasn't sure if it's sirens or sirens. I'll stick with sirens and <laughs> interpret it in your minds. Two famous captains brought their crews and ships safely past the island of the sirens. One captain, Odysseus, knowing the danger of the sirens, sirens put wax in the ears of his men uh, as they were rowing past so that they couldn't hear the sirens singing. However, he himself wanted to hear the sirens sing. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful singing. Um, so he asked his sailors to tie him to the mast of the post. And no matter what, um, they weren't to let him go. Um, but he, he wanted to enjoy, he wanted to enjoy the singing for a little while. And so they tied him up with ropes. Um, he said, don't, don't let me out until we're well past the island. So when Odysseus heard the sirens, he strained to get free, but was una unable to until the ship had passed the dangerous island and the sailors untied him. So Odysseus and his men survived their temptation and, their, and they continued on their journey. But the picture of Odysseus' passage past the island of the sirens is quite different from that of another ship that made its way safely past. Jason and his men also escaped death on the rocks of the sirens. Jason, however, had a lute player by the name of Orpheus who travelled with him. Orpheus's lute playing had the ability to totally captivate his hearers. As long as he played, anyone who listened to his music heard only his music. As soon as Jason's ship came near the island of the sirens, the crew assembled on deck in the shadow of the mast and Orpheus began playing his enchanting melodies. The siren songs were ignored because Jason and his men were captivated by the beautiful music of Orpheus. So Jason and his sailors passed safely by the sirens and continued on their journey. Some Christians like Odysseus long to hear the siren song of sin, but uh, they strap themselves to the mast to prevent them from yielding. Others have wax in their ears in order to drown out the song of sin. And when they make harbour safe at last, I'm sure they're happy. Um, yet along the way, it's a pretty sad picture. Here they are straining to, to, to listen to this song that is being played. But the sons and daughters of God are not prisoners to passion. They're not chained against their will to the mast, yearning uh, for the deadly embrace of sin. Uh, they're not, the path of a, the Christian is not just white-knuckling it and, and gritting their teeth. However, 
there are other Christians like Jason. And they find that the siren song no longer captivates them because they have heard a sweeter song. To them, the song of holiness is a song of joy. Under the cross, they are liberated because they hear a heavenly song. Holiness is not a burden, uh, but it's a joy to them. It's not a mere duty, uh, but it's a delight to them. And the fact is, God is more than willing uh, to play that sweeter song for us. Uh, We just have to learn to listen to it. We're told in the book, uh, The Ministry of Healing, It says, he has a song to teach us. And when we have learned it amid the shadows of affliction, we can sing it ever afterward. So we need to learn to hear. So how do we go about learning to hear the sweeter song? How do we avoid having to to go through our life uh, gritting our teeth and just trying to hold on for dear life while the world is playing this the song of sin to us. I'm going to share four suggestions to you that, if applied, uh, will help you hear and sing the sweeter song. The first one is we need to fill our house. Uh, Let's turn in our Bibles, if you've got your Bible handy. I'll have most of the verses on the screen, but uh, this one we can look up. So Matthew chapter 12, and this is 43 and 44. It's a very short parable. Says, starting in verse 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation." This parable tells of a man possessed by a devil. Uh, with Jesus likening, um, likening him to a, a messy house that, that's cluttered and unclean. But when the evil spirit is cast out, Jesus depicts his life as a, a clean house. It's been put in order. Uh, it's clean and orderly. But of course... That, that spirit that has been cast out doesn't stay wandering in deserted places, does it? It comes back and you know, that fits with what we know about how unclean spirits, how demons work. We read, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. After some time, that evil spirit returns to the man, And he finds him to be like a house, clean, well swept, and orderly. And yet the spirit enters the man and repossesses him, along with seven other spirits. Um, It wasn't because the house was clean that the spirit came back in, uh, that the spirit takes up residence. There is something else in that passage that explains why these seven seven other spirits can go and inhabit this man. What is it? It's an empty house, isn't it? Christ points out the house was empty and the evil spirit came accompanied by seven others and repossessed the house. It's a funny word in that context, repossessed. (laughs) But (laughs) that is what it is. Yeah. The man was worse off than before, wasn't he? Much worse off. Um, And that also fits with something that uh, we read in 2 Peter. It says, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, 
they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For if we would have been, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his vomit and so having washed, her, washed to her wallowing in the mire. Shortly before giving this parable, Jesus was driving out demons from people. Um, perhaps he was giving this parable as a warning to those people, uh, these people who were newly liberated from Satan. This parable illustrates that the entrance of Jesus into someone's life not only drives out the evil power, but it also purifies the person. Uh, when Jesus cast these demons out of people, it wasn't just the demon that was cast out, he, he cleaned their lives. But the parable tells us this isn't enough. We should be cleansed, nothing wrong with that, um, but we shouldn't be empty. Now when we come to attend revival meetings like 10 days of prayer uh, or if we hear a really moving sermon oftentimes we, we tend to experience something similar um, Jesus drives out the evil power in our lives but the fire of you know the temporary revival easily goes out and the problem with that is we risk ending up in a worse situation than when we were before um, you know, we, we have uh, we have this wonderful you know, week or, or two or, or you know, hour listening to something and, and we feel revived. Um, but afterwards, uh, when we're, we're back out in our day-to-day -day life, things, things return to normal. Uh, we get discouraged. And we, we ask the question, why, Lord? Wh why has this happened? Why does the impact of our revival meeting seem so short-lived? And the answer, according to this parable, according to Jesus, is the house stands empty. The house can be cleansed and put in order during a revival meeting, um, but if the house becomes empty afterwards, chances are it will be possessed again, and the latter end will be worse than it was in the beginning. So, what do we need to fill our house with? First of all, and most basically, we need to be filled with God's presence. Uh, we read in Psalm 16, it says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. According to this, what is it that gives us fullness of joy? Presence of the Lord. His presence gives us fullness of joy. Mm. This, this is a very, very basic thing, but we need to start our day with Jesus. Um, you wouldn't go into to battle without your armor. You wouldn't uh, go without your bodyguard. You wouldn't go to, to face an adversary if you, you, know, you didn't have strength and you didn't have food in your stomach. Uh, we wouldn't do that. You know, it, It's a good practice, Grace. Yeah. Um, you know, when when we're we're going about our day and we're faced with a temptation, uh, or we you know we're tempted to get angry with someone, we're we're tempted to lie about something, we're tempted to to lash out. At that point, it's often too late to try and give our, our will over to Jesus. If we haven't started our day giving our will to him at the beginning of the day, it's pretty hard later on when we're in, when we're in the heat of the moment. You know, yeah, it's like um, you're traveling down the road at 100 kilometers an hour and you turn to the person next to you driving along and you turn to the person and you say, oh, you take over driving, let's switch now. Uh, it's pretty hard at that point. Um, so we need to, to give put Jesus in the driver's seat at the beginning of the day we need to give our will to him mm. 
We read in Ephesians, And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. We want to be filled with God. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. We're instructed to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We must have time in the word and time in prayer. We must have time with Jesus if we want to be singing that sweeter song. If we want to have victory uh, as we go through our day, uh, we need time. And this can't be rushed. There's no shortcut to this. There's no quick quick version of this. Uh, In the book Prayer, we read, Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. They're in too great haste. With hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work. These workers can never attain the highest success until they learn the secret of strength. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. They need the uplifting influence of His Spirit. Receiving this, they will be quickened by fresh life. The wearied frame and tired brain will be refreshed. I don't know if your frame... And your brain needs to be refreshed. Um, I certainly feel that. Uh, The burdened heart will be lightened. If you have burdens on your heart, things that are worrying you, this is the way around it. Not a pause for a moment in his presence, but personal contact with Christ. To sit down in companionship with him. This is our need. Hmm. Be still. In fact... Um, what I've taken to doing, you know, it's, it's difficult when you've got work, when you've got a, a family to take care of, um, when you've got church commitments. It's tricky um, to, to be sometimes to make sure that you're putting first things first. Um, what I, I've taken to doing lately is I set a timer on my watch. Um, I set a timer where there are. You know, depending on where I am at the day, whether it's 15 minutes or half an hour, um, I set it, and that's my time with God. Can't get up until it's done. Uh, you know, that might sound methodical or, or clinical, but I think we could stand to be a bit more methodical uh, in our worship. And I found it really helps me. I get that time in. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we need discipline uh, desperately. Mm. That's right. Mm. We need to, to give our time and will to God each morning. We need to be filled with His presence. We also need to be filled with reverence for God. You know, reverence isn't a topic that we discuss much. Um, I, su- I suspect because it's mostly misunderstood. Um, but it is clear from Scripture that we're to treat Jesus with the reverence that he deserves. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now we see how the angels act in the presence of God. Uh, We read, skipping ahead, uh, Isaiah has this vision He sees the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In Leviticus 26, we're called to reverence his sanctuary. Um, although we no longer have an earthly sanctuary, uh, we can see that the sanctuary becomes 
and in this manner of speaking, uh, wherever we are dwelling with God. Uh, after all, that's why God made the sanctuary in the first place, he says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. When we're dealing with God, we are to show reverence, uh, whether that's here in church, uh, when we're bowing down to prayer at home, when we read our Bibles, uh, we need to remind ourselves of exactly who we are communicating with. Um, not allowing common things of life to interfere with that time. Now, that, that's another reason why I set the timer on my watch. During that time, no messages, no checking of things. Uh, it's time between me and God. Now, I think many people view reverence as uh, mere formalism, stuffiness. Um, perhaps you've been to a church where the worship seems to be rigid. Stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, sing now, etc., etc., as if done by rote. Um, we have forced silence in the congregation. But this isn't the reverence that God is calling us to. Um, although perhaps we should be some of those things. Um, we read that true reverence for God is inspired by a sense of his infinite greatness and a realization of his presence. With this sense of the unseen, every heart should be deeply impressed. The hour and place of prayer are sacred because God is there. And as reverence is maintained in attitude and demeanor, the feeling that inspires it will be deepened. So the more we react in a reverent way toward God, the more those feelings will be ingrained in us. The more we need to remind ourselves of who we're dealing with. That's what it comes down to. Our creator, uh, the one who turned the world upside down to redeem us, the same Jesus who fed the 5,000, who healed the lepers, who raised people from the dead. That's who we're talking to when we pray. That same same God. We need to be filled with praise and worship. We need to learn more about praise. Um, oftentimes when we come to church, we, well, at least speaking for myself, we come thinking, what can I get out of it? Uh, when we come to prayer, it's about getting God to help me. Um, that's, that's how it is for me oftentimes. Um, but the truth is God longs to receive our praise and adoration as well. Hmm. We're instructed to sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. In fact, this is an interesting verse. Uh, we're told that God inhabits the praises of his people. He says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabit, oh, I should have got the New King James verse, inhabits the praises of Israel. I've been trying to make changes in this area. Now, I used to think that music and, and singing was all right for some people. You know, some people got enjoyment, and their fix out of that, um, uh, and that was fine, um, but it wasn't a thing for me. Know, it satisfies some people's needs, and that's great. You know, meet everyone's needs at church, um, but that's changing. Uh, it's what I, I've been reading in Scripture. Um, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, we all need to be praising God. We all need to be worshiping Him. Um, uh, you know, I, I, if you have the three ABN app on your phone, there's a whole channel on there. Uh, for praise. Uh, it's mostly music. Uh, and I've been having that on at home and when I, I've been working, just playing, and it's nice. And I'm getting used to it um, and, and changing. Um, and as I listen to those songs and very occasionally join in, I, um, I find that I'm changing. I have a, a yearning in my heart for, for more beautiful things. Uh, for more heavenly things. And that's you know, part of the reason why we need to praise God. So that's a practical way that I've been trying to incorporate that into my life. Uh, more music uh, and getting used to that. 
We know that prayer changes things. Um, you've probably heard that statement before, prayer changes things, which is true. But so too does praise and worship, sometimes in quite miraculous ways. One example, uh, when they had finished building Solomon's temple. Notice what happened. This is after they had finished building it. It says, Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. So what happened when they were singing praises to God? What happened there? Yeah. God's glory filled the temple. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's like he inhabits the praises, which is what we just read. Now, if Jesus has cast out the unclean spirits and your house is empty, don't you think that the glory of God would be a good thing to fill that house with? I think so. Mm. That's right. Now this interesting situation in Second Chronicles chapter 20. The Ammonites and the Moabites come up against God's people at Jerusalem. God's people pray about it. The king leads out in worship, uh, in, in prayer. And the prophet, whose name I can't remember because it's, it's not a, a famous one, it's a funny name. Um, the prophet tells them that God will deliver them. He tells, tells all the people gathered that they'll be delivered. The people believe what the prophet has said, uh, which is where we get that oft quoted verse uh, where um, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. That's the context of that verse. They believe the prophet so much that the king says, essentially, our deliverance is sorted. <laughs> this battle is won. Instead of just sending the army out, let's put a, a praise and worship team in the front of the army. And they, can, they can go out first. Uh, he was that confident in what the prophet had said. And we read, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. And we read in the next verse, uh, these powers that had come against God's people, they ended up fighting each other and killing each other. God caused their enemies to destroy each other. Notice this promise uh, in the book, Mind, Character and Personality. It says, When the enemy comes with his darkness, sing faith and talk faith and you will find that you have sung and talked yourself into the light. I think that's a, a wonderful promise. With all that's going on in the world, you know, we, we look out, we look at the news, and we see the wheels of prophecy turning. Uh, we see things happening in the world uh, that, that, that might have us concerned. We might ask, you know, why is it important that we focus on these basic things? You know, the things that we've been talking about are pretty, pretty basic Christianity. Why is, it that, why is it important that we focus on these? Why is it important that we sing the sweeter song rather than just gritting our teeth and bearing it? Well, we know that very soon that worship is going to be a pivotal issue for the world. Unless our lives are filled with God's presence, reverence for him, praise for him, we're going to be in for a, an incredibly difficult time. Um, but if God is clearly dwelling in our house, then it doesn't matter how many unclean spirits come by looking for a place to, to stay, there will only be room in our hearts for God. 
There is one more practical thing that we can do to ensure us victory. If you learn how to master this one thing, there won't be anything that can stand in your way as a Christian. Oh, might have to look at that next week or next time I'm preaching. <laughs> Let's 